So uh, I'd like to, I guess, first off, uh, I woke up at 2 a.m. last night with my young two-year-old and we were looking outside and the moon was orange. And it's clear, therefore, that that is a sign that uh, we are in the middle of climate change. Uh, and uh, therefore, it makes sense for us to actually put that at the front of our minds and to say, what are the possible ways that we can mitigate the changes that we are making to our environment? And uh, it just so happened that we had scheduled PER uh, to talk about this exact subject. So that's absolutely amazing. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of a backstory on PER. So uh, PER is first and foremost uh, a professor here in the nuclear engineering department. Um, uh, and uh, he is the um, William and Jean McCollum Floyd Chair uh, here. And also probably most interesting and unique to uh, the Bay Area, he is also the chief uh, nuclear officer of Kairos Power, which is a startup that is located in Alameda, California, right down the road from us, uh, which is attempting to build a generation four uh, nuclear reactor uh, using uh, molten salt. So uh, her will tell you uh, how, uh, about how molten salt reactors could potentially fit into a carbon-free energy cycle. So Per, would you like to take over? Uh, thank you, Matt. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to join. I do hope the internet bandwidth is sufficient uh, that you'll be able to hear me clearly. If not, Matt, please, please let me know and I'll go back and repeat anything that doesn't come through. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to talk to the, the physics community here today and uh, to, to do so in this time where clearly clean energy is, is something that's going to be a priority. Let me go ahead and bring up some slides here to share. And so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about a, a set of topics that relate to nuclear energy. It's clearly impossible in the amount of time that we have that I can use today to, to cover all of the topics. And, and in particular, I think it's very important for us to emphasize that there are security dimensions associated with nuclear technologies. Of course, Berkeley has a very long history in this area and UC has supervised two of our na uh, nuclear national security laboratories over many years. We may come back to those sorts of topics during the course of the discussion. I do believe that, that when you look at nuclear energy holistically, you can find ways that you can achieve synergies between the security dimensions that we want to achieve and also safety and reliability. And I may be able to touch on that a little bit. But let me just go ahead and dive in. I think the vast majority of people are already familiar with, with the fission reaction. The, the key thing about it to remind everybody is that it has enormous energy density, which means that if you have a large scale power plant, say a thousand megawatts electric enough for, for nominally a million homes, the total fuel consumed, that is the amount of uranium that is fissioned, is about seven pounds per day. Now, of course, there's, there's other things that are involved in this process and the total amounts of waste are larger, but this is still a remarkably small quantity. Now, we wanna think about nuclear technology and nuclear energy in a more holistic sense. And so I've, I've listed what are some of the key, say, waste products that we generate from fission. And of course, the fission products are obvious and and some of them have moderately long half-lives, although the majority of them decay fairly rapidly. So one of the key safety issues for nuclear power is that capability to remove the heat that is being generated by fission products, even after one has shut down the nuclear chain reaction. The neutrons are also absorbed in other ways. And so we produce transuranics. We also activate structures, coolants, and there's transmutation. And it's always important in thinking about how to compare and contrast different energy sources to think in terms of life cycle, in particular, the things that are done in order to, to produce the materials that are needed to, to deploy the technology, and also uh, what's, what's generated in terms of, of the, the waste associated with producing fuel. Now, we can compare and contrast this with uh, fuel, sorry, fossil energy. 
And in the case of fossil energy, the, the energy is released by the chemical reactions between carbon and hydrogen and fossil form and oxygen is significantly smaller. So, so likewise, the energy density, about uh, say 29 megajoules per kilogram of fuel that one burns, a, the same thousand megawatt power plant, in this case powered by coal, consumes about 7 million kilograms per day of fuel. So, so uh, over about three orders of, mag or uh, I should say six orders of magnitude more. And also the volumes of waste that are generated are uh, clearly enormous. There really is not any practical way for us to use fossil fuels without discharging essentially all of the waste products into the environment. And this is the principal reason that we're seeing rising levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and why we have concerns associated with that as well. So the, the, the key point is that the quantities of fossil fuel that we're currently using are quite enormous. And in fact, it is, it is a real challenge to think through this question of how it is we can move downward or, 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 let, or use less fossil fuel. So when it comes to nuclear, I think there's, there's an important point, which is that uranium has turned out to not be scarce. And this is, this is a fairly simple calculation to, to express the cost of, of nuclear fuel. And this would be for today's light water reactors. And this includes the cost to, to purchase the natural uranium to convert it into uranium hexafluoride and enrich it to the necessary levels to use as fuel in a power plant and then to fabricate it into fuel. And if you add that all up and then, and then determine how much energy can be generated, it totals up to about 38 cents per million BTUs. And this is in contrast to what we would consider today to be inexpensive natural gas in the United States produced by fracking, which is about $3 per million BTUs. Now, the, the, um, the, the currently the prices have actually dropped to about $2, but drilling has also dropped considerably. So what we can see here is that, that the fuel today, even though we're only using a small fraction of the uranium that's mined in terms of what is visioned, is, is quite inexpensive. It raises a question, why is it today that we're seeing nuclear power plants that are fully depreciated shutting down because they cannot compete economically with natural gas when their fuel is so much cheaper? And the really quick and short answer is that nuclear plants, ex especially the existing ones, have pretty high operating costs, mainly because, mainly, they, require, no. mainly because they require large numbers of people uh, to, to, um, um, to, to operate and run them. So the first thing to do is to go ahead and place nuclear energy into a broader context. And so this is a comparison with other energy alternatives, of course, we're being motivated in doing this by the fact that we're seeing a systematic and continuing rise in carbon dioxide concentrations caused by the combustion of fossil fuels. And in fact, we're not, we're not seeing this curve turn over. That is, rates are still continuing to rise. This is, this is a, a little bit of a silly diagram, but, but it extrapolates out over the next 6,000 6, years what the concentrations of carbon dioxide would rise to if we were to continue to burn fossil fuel at these rates. And this is obviously a silly thing to do because it's physically, it, there's, there's a number of constraints that will, will definitely cause this curve to turn over going forward at some point. But I'd like to point out that, that the, the reason that this is interesting is because we can actually project the safety and we can safely manage waste from nuclear reactors over very long time scales. And so, so we worry a lot about waste from nuclear power. Those worries may be in some ways misplaced compared to what we should really care about, which is the fact that this is clearly an unsustainable trajectory. So when we ask the question, what sorts of energy technologies are capable of decarbonizing energy supply and particularly electricity supply, I'm gonna take a few minutes just to, to point out, and, and unfortunately I have to bash a bit Germany, 
because if you, if you look at what Germany has been doing with renewable energy, it has been quite ineffective in actually reducing carbon emissions from their electricity sector. And that is because they also burn large amounts of coal. And this is, this is time varying electricity, carbon intensity. And the reason it's shooting up and down so much in Germany is because intermittently, there's substantial amounts of renewable energy available. If we look at France, the reason why France's electricity emissions have been one-tenth of Germany ever since the 1970s is simply because they use lots and lots of nuclear power. So, so clearly what we've seen with nuclear is that it does have that fundamental capability to provide low carbon electricity and to displace other forms. In fact, when we look at, at France, France has been able to close all of its coal mines. The very last one closed in 2004, principally because it is essentially completely divested at this point from using any coal at all for electricity generation. Now, Another important example, and I apologize that this is a bit of a busy slide here, but another important example, I think, is California. And there's actually a little known record in California that occurred back in April 20th and 21st of 2019, which is for brief periods during each of those days, it was a weekend, California did actually achieve zero net carbon emissions from its electricity sector. And you can see this over here on the right. This is, this is the California Independent System Operator's daily curve of net carbon emissions. And you can note that it actually went slightly negative here on uh, April 21st. And, and on April 20th, it kissed against being zero. This is impressive, right? Because this is the first, this is the first point in history for a state the size of California to hit zero for carbon emissions. But if you start to dig into what actually happened, it raises some of the issues for this approach, which is principally that during that day, first of all, California, so if you take a look at carbon dioxide, California's natural gas plants never shut down, even though prices for electricity were negative. And so the first question to ask is, why is it that you're continuing to keep those plants operating in the middle of the day, even though you have number one, negative electricity prices, and even though, you know, number two, you have a surplus of electricity because the net zero, since we were actually burning fossil fuel in California, the way that we achieved net zero was by exporting surplus solar during the middle of the day, which got us to net zero. And so this is, this is one of the concerns is that in California, we're using imports to do the load following, and we're not actually shutting off our in-state natural gas. And uh, the, part of the reason for that is that, that it, you cannot shut down and restart these plants in the evening to provide this very rapid ramp up in, in electricity generation. So will California be successful in addressing this problem? The, 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 the real question is, is it practical to expect that we can deploy enough storage to do this? And when one starts to look at the amount of storage that would be required to even address one evening of electricity demand in California, you can do some simple calculations and conclude that it's probably impracticably large. Then when you look at the weekly, monthly, and seasonal variability and project that you would have to have even more storage than this, it draws into question whether we're going to be successful in actually decarbonizing electricity supply. Now, it is possible that that can occur, but it does point towards the importance for us to also be looking at how to develop and deploy dispatchable low-carbon electricity technology. And one of those candidates is nuclear energy. It has a set of issues. So I'm going to spend a bit of time sort of digging into some of those questions. And then we can begin to address whether, whether nuclear fission actually has that potential to be developed into a technology uh, that can be deployed to provide affordable, clean electricity at the scales needed to decarbonize world electricity supply. So one of the first issues that is raised and, and logically about nuclear power is the fact that it generates nuclear waste. And 
I think that it's important for us to, to place this into context. And in fact, this is one of the places where I really enjoy quoting Michael Schellenberger, who lives in Berkeley and is an environmentalist and, and, and speaks frequently on the topic of nuclear energy. And, and this quote, I, I think, is quite appropriate. Nuclear power's waste products aren't a mark against the technology. They are its key selling point. Let me explain why that's the case. So let's go to 2014. That year, nuclear electricity provided over 10% of the entire world supply. And if you were to take, now you're not going to do this physically, but if you were to take all of the spent fuel that was generated by reactors in that year and place it onto the Cal Memorial Stadium, which again, this is, this is hypothetical, it is radioactive, the total volume would fill the field up to a depth of 1.3 meters. Now, to have produced the equivalent quantity of energy by burning coal, the equivalent quantity of coal would have been 1 billion tons. And the height of that pile would be 230 kilometers. This is the problem. This is actually a manageable problem. So if, if, if from the perspective of nuclear waste, we currently lack the necessary societal and political will and confidence to, to, to place it into disposal, and there's logical reasons for that. If we're going to give our future generations a set of problems, what I can promise you is that managing the current inventories of nuclear waste is well inside what they can do. Managing the waste products from burning fossil fuels and increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this is where the real challenge is. And this is where it's quite unlikely that future generations really will be able to do any, anything to substantively reverse what's been happening with these emissions. So another way of looking at the problem of nuclear waste is just to look at the consequences of placing it into geologic disposal. And what we learn if you take a look, this is the Yucca Mountain Repository. And I'm, I'm actually at this point not a big fan of the Yucca Mountain Repository in part just because it's one of the most expensive solutions that we could possibly implement for geologic disposal of spent fuel because we had surprises in the licensing, the development and licensing of the repository in terms of how water flows through that repository, which led us to need to add in alloy 22 canisters and titanium drip shields and do a set of other things for engineered barriers that make this a pretty expensive choice. But the worst case consequence of placing a quantity of spent fuel uh, into Yucca Mountain that would essentially displaces billions and billions of tons of coal that would have been burned is that in another 100,000 to, to longer period of time, there could be some groundwater contamination in this region of the Armagosa Valley. And pretty much, if you were to drill a well in this location, you could get contaminated water. That is, that is pretty much the worst case scenario for geologic disposal of nuclear waste. And if we believe that that's a problem, we should be looking at the, the, the burdens that we've already generated with the disposal of chemical waste. Because the, 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 here we have significantly larger amounts of groundwater that are already contaminated, and therefore that will require that humans in the future implement reasonably good public health practices to be able to, to, to purify and deliver clean, clean water. Having abundant and affordable energy makes it a lot easier to meet many of these important public health objectives such as supplying clean water. I'd also like to point out that innovation is quite possible in this field. In fact, I'm confident that there's people at the physics department that are familiar with a company named Deep Isolation, uh, or at least with one of its co-founders, Rich Muller. And uh, among all of the things that Rich has done, including writing really fantastic textbooks uh, and founding Berkeley Earth and, and a number of other things, he's a co-founder of a company that is working on developing a borehole-based disposal method that leverages the major advances that have occurred in the last 20 years or so with respect to horizontal drilling. And it's actually a tremendous technology, partly because the costs of getting waste in place are reduced enormously 
compared to what it takes if you're going to spend the money to build mined underground facilities, which is the conventional approach for geologic disposal. And it also has significantly better attributes with respect to worker safety. Because you're in placing in horizontal environments where you can do excellent characterization of the geological conditions, you're also able to place these materials, and it's in the form of canisters that go down into the drill holes, you're limited in size. So you're taking in and putting in, say, one assembly from a pressurized water reactor in each canister, but the volumes that you can get with a two mile stretch of horizontal drill hole are pretty substantial. So, so this, I think this is an interesting technology also because we've, we've hit this wall of societal consensus around the Yucca Mountain project. And so we've ceased doing work on it back in 2010. Since then, the Nuclear Waste Fund has been accumulating revenues and the courts actually ordered the DOE to stop collecting the fee back in 2014. Today it contains $40 billion. If one were to go to technology like this, which significantly reduces the cost of the waste disposal part, we may never actually need to restart collecting the fee. And this would be interesting because for nuclear waste to be the problem where you can get the disposal done for free would certainly turn on the head the way we think about nuclear waste. But in fact, given the amount of money that is sitting now in the nuclear waste fund, that's actually a quite plausible future scenario. So if, if nuclear waste is indeed a manageable problem, then what do we need to fix in order for fission energy to actually play a substantive role going forward in terms of world energy supply? And clearly we need to think through what is it that currently impedes the deployment of new fission energy systems. It's not the cost of the fuel, because that's quite low. So it's got to be something else. It's not the waste because currently the federal government will enter into a contract with utilities to take all of the spent fuel and the fee that the federal government is charging today is zero. So it's not the waste. It's the cost of everything else. How can we change this? Well, one thing is clear is that construction costs are a big issue. When you look at the construction cost per kilowatt of new capacity, uh, our experience was that at, actually it was quite affordable in the early days. And then something happened. There was a big event that occurred in 1979. So essentially every plant that had received its operating license prior to 1979 when we had the Three Mile Island accident had construction costs that today would be very good. And then post-1979, the cost to finish construction on plants skyrocketed. Moreover, what we're seeing today in trying to build conventional large advanced light water reactors in the United States is that the ability to do that in a cost-effective way is quite questionable. We're, we're actually seeing projects that are canceled in the United States and, and costs over $10,000 per kilowatt. In parallel, in China today, nuclear plants are routinely being built down around the $2,000 per kilowatt level. And at $2,000 per kilowatt, most models show that we would deploy large amounts of nuclear energy into clean electricity systems. So what makes them so expensive? This is a table of all of the materials that go into building nuclear plants, in comparison with wind turbines, this is a Vestas wind turbine, and, and just to, to place everything into perspective, in comparison with the materials needed to produce automobiles, with, with the, the, the one that's shown here being typical of a Chevy Malibu type of size and class of vehicle. And there's, there's a lot of, of sort of details here, but you can see each of these commodities, these are prices from a few years ago. Um, but they, they, the, the changes have not been substantial. So these, these are the commodities and these are the quantities consumed to build these different types of things. And what you can do is you can add up and see that, that the total cost of all of the raw materials needed to build nuclear plants. This is a conventional 
generation two pressurized water reactors totals up to about 35 bucks per kilowatt, which out of the $5,000, which is actually a pretty low price compared to what some of the plants are coming in at is less than 1% of the purchase price. When you look at wind turbines and add up all the inputs and commodities, it turns out to be about 11%. And when you look at even an automobile, the raw materials are up at about 7.5%. So, so why is it that a wind turbine company using the same materials can deliver technology at a per pound price that's one-tenth of what it takes to build nuclear reactors. And what I can say is that there's no fundamental physics that require nuclear reactors to be 10 times as expensive as windmills per pound. There's, some, there, there's a whole set of other things that go into increasing these prices. If we can figure out what they are and make technology changes, that allow us to get something closer to what, what would be a commercial price for similar technology while achieving the appropriate levels of safety and other attributes, that would be a major advance. All right, so, so where can we find examples for innovation that might take us in that direction? I've, I've got a couple of examples here and I have to go through them fairly quickly given the limited amount of time and, and the desire to be able to cover at least a few questions. I'm going to point to, first of all, major changes that have happened in our ability to operate existing plants with high reliability. I'm going to talk about other heavily regulated industry where innovation occurs routinely. And so the, the F, FDA regulates biotechnology, medical devices and drugs. They are just as stringent as the NRC, but innovation happens routinely in that field. And then also I wanna to touch on commercial space launch. So it's not necessarily that well known, but there were, have been major changes in the way nuclear power plants are run and operated. So if one goes back, this is, this is before 1990, the reliability of nuclear power plants in the United States was, to be really frank, quite poor. And th so this is what we call the capacity factor it's essentially the fraction of plants that are running on average at any given period of time compared to what the maximum could be if everything was running at full power. And you can see that we were down around 60%. Starting around 1990, something radical and transformative was happening. And within a decade, we had changed to about 90%, of which actually about 80% or 8% of that is for scheduled maintenance outages. So there was radical improvement in the reliability of the plants during this period. And this can be credited back to a number of factors, but probably the most important was the fact that we deregulated electricity supply in the early 90s. And it wasn't deregulation, but it was the fact that you could start to sell plants instead of having to decommission them if they were performing poorly. And we had a set of plants at that time that were being decommissioned because their capacity factors were so low that the revenues were not covering their operating costs. In the early 90s, it became possible for utilities to sell these plants. Several were sold at about $20 a kilowatt. And immediately within 18 months of every sale, the plant's capacity factors had skyrocketed to be above 85% immediately became apparent that it had nothing to do fundamentally with the technology. It was just the competence of the leadership of the plants. That was it. And setting high expectations is really important because you can, if you set high expectations, you can get good performance. And I could go into a lot more details about how this happened, but one of the things that it does is it gives us confidence that if we do it correctly, we can get reactors to run with high reliability. Now, the other question is how to be more innovative in licensing. I'd like to point out, for example, that the FDA has a very different licensing process than the NRC. Conventionally, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, their position was, if you want to get a license for your reactor, complete an entire application, give it to us, we'll review it for three to five years, and we'll give you an answer back about whether we're going to approve it or not. 
that implies taking on a huge amount of risk. Within the field, and, and believe it or not, we now have a, effectively a phased licensing approach with the NRC. They, they figured out how to work inside their own regulatory framework to make it possible to use uh, things like topical reports to get earlier answers that are essentially equivalent to what you get with your phase one, phase two, phase three decisions that allow investors to make investment decisions in developing new drugs and such. The other thing that's quite interesting is that we've seen a remarkable success come from, out of from NASA from their commercial orbital transportation services program. And there's a company called SpaceX that was founded in 2002. SpaceX launched their first Falcon 1 successfully, that was the fourth launch attempt in 2008. They had already received some funding from, in our, from, from NASA, but it was in the form of payment for milestones type of contract. And after the successful launch of the first Falcon 1, they received a contract for resupply to the International Space Station. 2012, the first successful resupply mission to the International Space Station. 2018, and SpaceX had captured over half of the entire world market share for commercial space launch, which is, is quite impressive. If nuclear could do anything close to this, it would make a major difference. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but what I can tell you is that if you go and talk to senior people at SpaceX, and if you go and look and, and learn the lessons for how they achieved it, they did many different things, but probably the most important was that they built hardware, tested it until it broke, figured out why, and that repetitive work to, 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 to build and test until you've really got something that works well, is just a part of the ethos. The, the SpaceX is also heavily vertically integrated. And so they manufacture most of the systems that they use in comparison to the conventional modern defense and aerospace approach of, of outsourcing all of the major subsystems and being stuck with sort of rigorous and cumbersome needs to, to, to specify requirements much earlier in the process than is efficient when you'd like to be able to trade off requirements between different systems. So this is, this is an additional example. And, and then by the way, SpaceX also figured out how to re-land their rockets. They didn't try to do that until they already had a really good one uh, that was an expendable rocket. But of course, this, this being able to, being, having an architecture that, an architecture that allows you to fail and learn from your failures was the thing that allowed them to eventually get to the point where routinely, consistently, they stick the landings and they recycle and reuse their rocket first stages. It's absolutely impressive what it is they've accomplished. All right. So before going into sort of advanced reactors and a quick overview of what's possible there, I do think it's important to do a quick summary of what are the most important technical issues that one needs to evaluate and understand in order to design safe fission energy systems. And there's really four ingredients. The first is that you want to design reactor cores to have intrinsic negative feedback, such that if the, if the core heats up or if the coolant is removed, the reactor will shut itself down in terms of the fission reaction. And we've, we've had experience, the Chernobyl reactor is one example. We're not designing to have those sorts of negative feedback mechanisms ended up being a significant and severe problem. Even after reactors shut down, you will continue to have decay of fission products, reliably removing the heat to control the temperatures that you reach in the shutdown condition is also important for safety. And probably the most important advances we've achieved since the early 1990s is the approaches to replace active systems that re require electricity pow power supply to, pro to provide this cooling with passive systems that do it all by gravity. 
And there's a long story about how we developed the confidence that we could predict the multi-physics behavior of these passive systems and quantify the, the uncertainty and that reliability. But this is, I think is, th this, this ability, both with the existing, you know, the new white water-cooled reactor designs and non-water-cooled to implement passive safety is one of the major advances that we can credit uh, having achieved over the last couple of decades. The next part is to have effective confinement of radionuclides through multiple barriers and implementing defense in depth so that you're not reliant on any single barrier as the sole thing that keeps radioactive materials from being discharged in the environment. And then finally, we need to be able to design this equipment to be, to be uh, 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 resilient against a variety of different external events, uh, uh, hurricane-driven uh, you know, missiles like telephone poles and such, seismic events like earthquakes, floods, uh, uh, high winds, all of that. And so a key thing to emphasize is that safety regulation is important, just as it is for other key industries that have the potential, you know, basically generate high benefits, but require that we manage hazards in ways that protect public health, worker safety, and the environment. Right. So if we're going to do this, I would say this is the list of, of directions that, that will lead us to improve technologies, will allow us to do this type of SpaceX-like rapid iteration. The first is to implement passive safety. There's a number of interesting implications about passive safety, but I think one of the most important is actually, one can greatly reduce the number of armed guards that you need at a plant if they're not responsible for trying to protect active equipment where they have to make sure that the electricity supply and everything else is protected. In fact, the passive equipment, those passive systems are so rugged, they are generally isolated inside all of these missile bearers. They don't require routine surveillance and access by, by operators. Therefore, it's actually easy to design them to be just like bank vaults, very hard to get to, which greatly reduces physical security requirements. Making reactors smaller, there are economies of scale, but the ability to iterate and to learn from doing is something that we get with smaller reactors. And then the, the, the next big set of questions really relate to our practical path, especially towards moving away from water as a reactor coolant. And at this point, I'd, I'd point out that, that there's logical reasons why we ended up with water-cooled reactors for the first major application of fission energy, which was to provide propulsion for submarines. Uh, in, in a submarine, you have no concern about how heavy the reactor is. So you can tolerate a water-cooled reactor that's going to be heavy because it operates at very high pressure. You can tolerate the fact that it's going to have quite, quite low thermal efficiency because you have an infinite heat sink to dump the waste heat into. And finally, um, you, you, there's a lot of logic if you're Admiral Rickover, and this is an urgent national priority to get submarines functioning because, because literally this is a much better alternative to land-based ballistic missiles. Um, if you're in that position, being able to leverage all that existing technological capability that we have with water and steam and turbines, everything made sense. The big issue is that when you get into accident space where water-cooled reactors start to see fuel damage, they behave uniquely badly. That is, the, when you begin to damage zirconium, it oxidizes and steam, it, it, it releases hydrogen, and your fission products, the most important fission products, cesium and iodine, take volatile forms. They get mobilized as fine aerosols. You have intrinsic high pressure. You have enormous amounts of stored energy. And therefore, you have mechanisms to release this material. If you look at essentially any other coolant that has been seriously studied for nuclear reactors other than water, this just doesn't happen. And in particular, when we look at molten salts, the, the, it it's becomes in these systems 
difficult or physically impossible to mobilize cesium and iodine, and therefore to have reactor accidents that have major offsite consequence, or that can also, well, major offsite consequences, including in the case of accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima, the need to implement long-term land use restrictions, which is, which is just really bad for public confidence and, and be, <laughs> frankly, not being able to go back after something like that may, is what makes the Fukushima accident what we remember and the tsunami that killed 18,000 people is already largely forgotten. All right, so what are the options for the future going forward? I'm going to spend time mainly focused on, on, on molten salt options. We can also cool reactors with water, helium, various types of liquid metals. I'll try to explain a bit what some of the incentives are for molten salts. I'll also point out that the other types of reactors have significant potential too, but my main, my main work has been focused on molten salts for a variety of different reasons. And, and therefore, everybody here in the physics department gets to hear me talk about molten salts. So uh, molten salts actually were studied extensively. I'm going to be focusing on molten salt reactors that have thermal spectrum. That is where there's a moderator material, generally graphite, that slows neutrons down to energy levels where there's nice big cross sections for fission, and therefore where you can, you can get reactors to go critical and to operate with quite dilute quantities of fissile material. And the neat thing about the molten salts, especially the fluoride salts, is that you're taking highly reactive metals, in this case, and the one we're interested in, it's lithium and beryllium, reacting them with a, a highly reactive oxidizer, which is fluorine, the resulting salt has tremendous chemical stability, very high melting temperature, well, high melting temperature, but more importantly, very high boiling temperature, meaning that you have intrinsic low pressure. There's no way to, to boil these salts in any practical sense or to achieve high pressure because of the fact that they have these high boiling temperatures, which in turn allows you to run them at significantly higher temperature even than liquid metal reactors, and certainly down here at about 320 is where the water-cooled reactor. So you're up in the 600 to 700 degree range once you're starting to work with molten salts. They have other nice attributes such as being transparent. The other thing that I'd like to point out, we're focused on working with this lithium beryllium fluoride salt. The volumetric heat capacity of these salts is enormous compared to everything else. It's four and a half times larger than the volumetric heat capacity of sodium, uh, quite a bit higher than lead, enormously higher than helium, and actually even a bit higher than water. Having high volumetric heat capacity means that the, the, the volumes that you need to pump around are small, and that results in great reductions in, in the size of pipes, in the size of pumps, and in the size of, of the equipment and hardware. So at Berkeley, We've been working for quite a few years on molten salt technology, and this is just a quick summary of a major DOE initiative that was started in 2012. We collaborated with MIT and University of Wisconsin. What we were doing is we we're focused on going back to the old molten salt reactor designs that had the fuel dissolved in the coolant and looking at how to adapt and update those designs to work with solid fuel under the premise that, that technologically it's easier for first of a kind to license and deploy and test solid fuel reactors. And this is actually turning out to be true. There was a number of conceptual designs that were generated at Berkeley and at Oak Ridge National Lab. Lots of experiments and simulations, both working with the prototypical salts and fuels and other things, and also with scaled experiments using water and heat transfer oil. And then we also at Berkeley conducted a series of workshops on the, 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 the major technical issues around how to license these reactors, how to, what the experiments needed to be to validate safety models, what are the codes and such that you could use, and what was a path forward for test reactors. Currently, there's actually, <laughs> there's probably about 50 different startup companies in the world, most of them in North America. 
working today to develop various different fission reactor designs. Uh, a couple of, of well-known ones, Bill Gates, TerraPower is working on molten chloride fast reactor technology. There's a company in Canada called Terrestrial Energy. There's another US-based one called Thorcon. Uh, at Berkeley, we'd been working on developing a solid pebble fuel salt-cooled reactor technology. By 2016, it had become clear that we'd reached the point where to make substantive additional progress, we needed to move the activity out into the private sector. And so that's when we founded the company, uh, myself and a couple of my graduate students and then some others uh, named Kairos Power. Kairos Power is headquartered in Alameda, out on the former Naval Air Station. If, if, you, if you've been down the Bladium and other things down on Alameda Island, then, then you know this area. It's a startup company, so it's really, it is, it is focused singularly on the mission of enabling the world's transition to clean energy uh, by commercializing this particular fluoride salt cooled high temperature technology. Uh, current staffing is slightly above 115 employee, 150 employees, 90% uh, are engineering staff. And really the focus is on leveraging the potential that comes from this combination of, of uh, coolant uh, and fuel. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details because it's good to leave at least a few minutes uh, for questions here at the end. But the major focus is on deploying the technology and having commercial reactors functioning before 2030. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a side-by-side -side comparison. The, the, if you take a look at the size of these reactors, and actually at this point it's 320 megawatts and uh, uh, 140 megawatt electric, uh, but this is sort of the physical size of an FHR reactor. You can compare it with helium and sodium and water-cooled variants. And there's a set of reasons why this type of reactor technology has the potential to have significantly reduced capital cost. And because it delivers heat at higher temperatures than the other reactor uh, types to also achieve much higher uh, efficiency in the conversion of heat into electricity. The interesting point about the fuels that are being used is that they were developed for helium cooled reactors and they can go to temperatures the, the, the most recent testing has taken these, temp these fuels up to temperatures above 1600 degrees centigrade, well above the melting temperature of steel without releasing radioactive material. So it's pretty impressive. Intrinsic low pressure system, ability to absorb fission products into the primary coolant, uh, effective passive decay heat removal, those are attributes. The, the company is really focused on standing up and performing these major hardware iterations using a set of laboratory facilities that have been deployed. The RNS labs are, are now operating and functioning in our Alameda headquarters. The T facility is now uh, in construction in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and U facility will follow within the next two to three years. Um, these are the physical locations of the infrastructure that we've deployed. And the, the, if, if you're interested in additional information, there's a couple of links here. I would recommend looking up Kairos Power on LinkedIn uh, because that's where you'll find more information than, than uh, probably from other sources. And at this point, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pause. I, I know I haven't said a lot about the specifics of what Kairos Power is doing. I'm, I'm happy to answer additional questions in that area. I think it, it, this, this, this should give us about 10 to 15 probably 10 to 15 minutes uh, for answering questions that people might have. And so I'll pause here and uh, take questions. Thanks, Burr. So we did receive a few questions. So Good. the first one was, how does a molten salt reactor give you passive safety? Ah, this is good. So the, 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 basic, the basic requirement to be called Do you have any slides by chance on, on this? Or? Ah, yeah, let me see if I can go back. Um, well, this is, this is a good example because, because this is an example of a reactor that implements passive safety. This is the Mark I design. What Kairos is doing is modify some of the basic things. But the, the major idea behind passive safety is to be able to shut a reactor down and remove decay heat 
without requiring external sources of electrical power. And so we've always had paths of safety from the perspective of reactivity control. That is, the fission reactions in well-designed reactors have always uh, been, been uh, limited by negative feedback and to shut the reactor down, to insert control and shut down elements, the way that you actuate them to drop is by removing electrical power that is holding magnetic latches in place in some cases. And so the, the reactivity insertion system or the reactivity um, shutdown systems pa function passively because you remove external source of power and then they function by gravity or other built-in forces. The key thing, that is different with fully passively safe reactors is that the heat removal of the decay heat also does not require external sources of electrical power. And in this case, this is what's called a direct reactor auxiliary cooling system. There's, there's a variety of different ways that you can set up gravity driven processes to extract decay heat. But basically in this case, the natural, the, the, the molten salt circulates naturally just because it's hot it rises, it gets cooled, and it flows down. So you set up natural circulation flows inside the reactor vessel that then establishes natural circulation flows up to a passive heat sink. And the heat, the, these, these systems are actuated by either just always being turned on or by being actuated by removing power from valves that fail to the on position. Without, by not requiring electrical power, of course, this, this makes these systems quite rugged and resilient against events such as station blackout. The other key thing is that we have the capability to develop and, and, and test these passive safety systems using what are called integral effects tests. We, the, the first iteration for the FHR type of integral effects test is the thing that we deployed it at UC Berkeley, in fact, I think there may be a photo. Yeah, so this is, this is actually the compact integral effects test. This, this is an example of a test facility which is, is designed to validate the, the system models for the integrated behavior from heat source all the way to passive heat sink. And so the, the, the CIET facility actually allows us to replicate all of the major functions of an FHR. And over sitting next to it, right over here to the left outside the picture is the control room simulator that we built. Because if you have an integral effects test, you have an experimental system that, that replicates all the major functions of an actual reactor. You need a control system. You might as well work out all of the controls and control room type of things at the same time. And so we have students that work on those things as well. So that, that's kind of a long winded description of what constitutes passive safety. Uh, next from Warren, we have, how does the Kairos reactor differ from other advanced efforts, uh, both in the US as well as in China, France, et cetera? Yeah, so, so Kairos is, curr is, is currently the only advanced reactor developer that is working on the design of molten salt reactors that use solid fuel. And so, so really what, what distinguishes what Kairos is doing is that we're using this, this lithium beryllium fluoride salt that was originally developed and used at Oak Ridge National Lab in the molten salt reactor experiment. And actually, if, if you're interested in thorium as a, a future energy source, this molten salt fly is really, really interesting. Um, the, the Kairos reactor does not use thorium but then the, the Falcon 1 and the first Falcon 9s didn't have landing legs either. So, so the fact that, 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 that Kairos Power is focused on uranium-based reactors is logical because that's, the, that's really the correct first step. But the, the key thing that Kairos is doing differently is we're using triso fuel. All of the other startup companies and, and other companies that are working on high temperature reactors with triso fuel are using helium as the coolant. So it's, it's really that unique combination of a, of a liquid coolant, low pressure operation, and therefore the, the, the power density that you can achieve with the liquid cooling is a factor of five to 10 larger than you can with helium. So the reactor also ends up being much more compact. So 
th th those are the key things that differentiate what Kairos is doing. The full spectrum of coolants and fuels, if you, if you were to ask me, just take any randomly that you're aware of, I could probably point to some company that is working on that particular variant uh, of, of a reactor at this point. There's, there's quite a few parallel efforts going on. So uh, Eli asked, uh, why were molten salt reactors, or I'm sorry, molten sodium, re sodium reactors funded when salt, uh, molten salt reactors were, was, in your opinion, a more obvious solution? So, so you'd have to go all the way back to the 1960s and 70s. And we were, of course, commercially deploying water-cooled reactors. The, the two major, well, actually, back in the 1960s, the United States was studying any and every type of reactor you could possibly think of, even things like organic coolants, which were pretty rapidly abandoned because there really don't turn out to be any organics that have sufficient stability under radiation and such. But back in the 1950s, there was a belief that uranium was scarce. And therefore, there was a belief that an absolutely essential thing we needed to do as fast as we could was to develop breeder reactors that could, could utilize very scarce uranium resources very, very efficiently. Because the thermal spectrum reactors, the water-cooled reactors, are using less than 1% of the uranium. Um, the, 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 the premise that uranium is scarce, of course, is, has demonstrably been proven to not be correct. Back in the day, the fast spectrum reactors were really focused on uranium cycles. In parallel, people were starting to look at molten salts. It had grown out of the aircraft nuclear propulsion program because the molten salts turn out to be the most logical alternative if you're interested in des developing reactors that can achieve sufficiently high temperature and efficiency and be light enough that you could credibly get them into an airplane. Putting reactors in airplanes is crazy, which is really unfortunate because that means that we commercialize the logical technology for submarines. It's, it's just kind of unfortunate that it wasn't flipped the other way. But, but the, so the molten salt reactors, um, they can work with thorium and they can achieve also very efficient use. The competition, the competition, there's a variety of different stories about it. Just suffice to say that the molten salt work got canceled in the early 1970s and we went whole hog off on sodium fast reactors and we've never been able to get them to be successful ever since. So that's, that's sort of the story and beyond that, the fortunate thing is that we have this opportunity today to go back and revisit and redo a lot of that work. And what we're finding is that there's compelling advantages to making use of the molten salts, mainly because that very high volumetric heat capacity results in remarkable size reduction. And also because, because they're chemically stable, they have excellent properties with respect to, to essentially compatibility with high temperature structural materials and delivering heat to achieve high thermal efficiency. Okay, thanks. And then Eli also asked, are you planning catastrophic shutdown tests to validate robustness of your passive cooling? So passive that's, an, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent question. It is much better if you can test everything to failure again and again uh, so that you can figure out why things break. One of the big issues with the water-cooled reactors is that it is not practical to test the fundamental safety systems that you're using. Um, it, 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 unfortunately, uh, the, the, um, there's, there's no way, you know, the large break loss of coolant acts that nobody's going to perform the test of, of strapping on a couple kilograms of C4 onto the cold leg of a reactor and detonating it to prove that afterwards the emergency core cooling system is going to work. A really big benefit of working with the low pressure systems and chemically state all of that is that you can actually test the safety systems under uh, uh, conditions which match those that you expect to have in your design basis accidents. So, so that ability to test and to license by test is, is something that becomes practical if you're working with molten salt reactor technology. Thank you. So uh, our final question is uh, uh, from Renit. Uh, nuclear power power clearly has a PR problem, uh, to which saying it's next generation isn't sufficient. What do you think is the best way to change people's minds about nuclear power? 
Well, the first thing is that, that the nuclear field also has had tremendous amount of hype, uh, routinely over-promising and under-delivering. So, so I'll, the, one of the things I'll tell you is just going out and, and making a whole bunch of promises about how much better everything is going to be just isn't going to work. So I, I think, I, I really do believe that, that we have to get back into that mode where we're actually building and testing and proving it with hardware and that we should be quite humble. This is, this is a difficult technology. Hyping that it's going to be the miracle cure is not really productive. On the other hand, of all of the things we can possibly do to save humanity uh, and to address climate change, nuclear fission is probably at the top of the list. Getting it right and doing it well could be enormously beneficial. And also, the United States has played a unique role in nonproliferation. There's a nuclear nonproliferation treaty, other things. Maintaining leadership in this field, I think, is also essential if we want to see a future world where we manage proliferation and nuclear security risks appropriately. And strengthening institutions like the International Atomic Energy Agency really is a path forward for us to do that as well. So, so overall, hyping nuclear power is just not helpful, but working hard and proving but that we can do things better is probably the best way to regain credibility with the public. Okay. Uh uh, if, uh, thank you very much for, for coming to talk with us. Uh, we appreciate it immensely. It was really informative. Thank you so much. I, I, this, is, this is such a wonderful group of people. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and that, that you've taken the time. Th thank you so much. I, I've really enjoyed it. And, and uh, there's lots more to learn on the web. This is, an important, this is an important area to be watching. Things will be happening, I can promise you. And there's reason to be optimistic that we may actually be doing things better going forward than we have in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.